So it's a pleasure to be here amongst our friends and future partners whom we look forward to collaborating with. My name is Carl, and I'm the country head for our firm operations here in Malaysia. Malaysia, as you know, consists of two parts, West Malaysia, where our capital of Kuala Lumpur is, and East Malaysia, on the island of Borneo, which consists of two states, Sabah and Sarawak. Our time with you today will be focused on discussing matters pertaining to Sabah, and I hope it will be informative and engaging for all of us today. Um, but before that, just, just to share a few words on our organization for those whom have not heard of us yet. We are a global organization with headquarters in Switzerland and offices spread across five continents. Our work focuses on social and environmental transformation in commodity supply chains of palm oil, pulp and paper, rubber, cocoa, and many more. Our membership base includes both upstream and downstream companies, and through collaboration with them, we strive to bring impact to the regions that we work in. So now on to Sabah. Our work in Sabah really started 10 years ago on the back of collaboration with Nestle in exploring the no deforestation, no peat and no exploitation policy, in short, NDPE. So we did so in palm oil supply chains. And the time spent visiting and assessing the upstream of these supply chains took us deep into palm oil estates, mills, small farms across the state. Through the years, we started to develop a deep understanding of what the environment and social issues were, and they were diverse, complex, and some deeply rooted. However, amongst the challenges were also companies and individuals whom would have committed to bring positive transformation on these same issues. So we are very fortunate to have worked with them as they are leaders in their own right, and together with them, we have embarked on a transformative journey which now provides a path of which others can follow. So we are excited to share some of these stories with you today. I'm very happy to introduce to you our line of speakers. So first off, we got uh, Mr. Prasad Vasudevan. So Prasad is a true and true community engagement leader. He started our smallholder program called Rurality in Sabah five years ago and have successfully built a team of competent officers who work with smallholders on a daily basis at our project sites. So he will be sharing with you the ins and outs of our work and his hopes for the future. Next, what better way to hear from a farmer himself? We are glad to have Mr. Herbert Tingu or Uncle Herbert join us today. It's a long way in Sabah, so if the internet connection holds up, we will be fortunate to hear from him, his views about the relationship we have built in the community. Uh, for those whom have heard about our work, in mitigating human-elephant conflict, we couldn't have done so without the guidance and partnership with Dr. Farina. She's the founder of an amazing organization called Sratu Atai, and they are dedicated in promoting coexistence between humans and elephants. So after Uncle Herbert, she will be sharing with us about the importance of on-the-ground collaboration in mitigating conflict with wildlife. Dr. Mark Ancrenas, the co-founder of French NGO Hutan, and co-director of the Kinabatangan Orangutan Conservation Program is here with her as well. And saving the best for last, we have our colleague, Mr. Pierre Boxted, whom is the Global Sustainability Manager for Racket. So what we do on the ground would not be as impactful without the partnership with committed companies like Racket. Their trust in the project helps us scale our impact to where it's much needed. So you might be asking why, well, why are we having this webinar now? Uh, essentially, we see that our work in Sabah is starting to mature. The pilots have generated convincing results and we are now looking to scale this widely in the emerging landscape that will be our focus from 2021 onwards. So today we want to share these stories and vision with you. Lastly, uh, we will have some time towards the end for questions and answers. So please type your questions in the Q&A function by stating to whom it is directed to, and we will do our very best to discuss them. And also to note this, uh, we will be actually recording this webinar. So uh, without further ado, let me present to you the first speaker for today, Mr. Prasad. Prasad, over to you. 
Thanks, Carl. Good day to all the audience. It's a pleasure to be here today to share with all of you about our journey in Sabah. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, okay, good. So let me start with some high level uh, context about Sabah. So when we talk about forests, the forests of Sabah are among the most biodiverse in tropics. It is home for the Bornean pygmy elephants, orangutan, Rafflesia, and many more other species. At the same time, the state also has about 1.5 million hectares of oil palm plantations that make it as the second largest oil palm planted area in Malaysia. As for the whole of Sabah, there are over 30,000 independent smallholders who depend on their land for their livelihood, especially cultivating oil palm trees. So as most of us are aware, these independent smallholders contribute significant percentage of raw materials to nearly all commodity supply chains, including palm. Therefore, engaging and supporting smallholders' transformation activities will be important for most of the companies in meeting their responsible sourcing commitments. Since 2015, under our smallholder program, we have established field teams that operates in the districts of Luran, Kinabatangan, Lahadatu, Tulupit, and Tongwat. These districts now forms the core area of EF's landscapes program. As you all can see, this core area is highlighted in the map that you're all seeing now. So our field team, who mostly all are local, have been actively interacting and engaging with independent oil pump smallholders, local stakeholders, to understand the smallholder situations and implementing smallholder transformation projects in the supply base of EF members who have been sourcing palm oil from these districts. So in this past year, over 900 smallholders were outreached and engaged by this field team. So in terms of the migrant workers context in Sabah, Due to shortage of local labor, the palm oil industry is heavily dependent on migrant workers. Sabah hosts the highest number of non-Malaysian migrant workers, especially from the neighboring Indonesia and Philippines. In Sabah, we can see the presence of both male and female workers in the palm oil industry, as well as their children living with them in plantation. They are granted family visas, unlike in Peninsula Malaysia. So these migrant workers and their families can experience poor working conditions, poor working and living conditions, and a lack of access to services such as education for their children. So building on this context, since 2017, EF also has begun initiatives to improve the well-being of children in the oil palm plantations in Sabah. So in these next few slides, I'll be sharing more details of our journey so far. So when we were conducting our field diagnostics, one of the highlighted issues by smallholders were the crop rates by wildlife and especially elephants. So due to the habitat fragmentation, elephants are increasingly traveling through or being in the vicinity of plantations. This often results in crop rates, especially during replanting into young crops because the elephants are attracted to the young crops. This is an economic loss to the smallholder and the plantations. At times, this conflict can be endangering to both elephants and humans. Often, what we have seen, the individual efforts on the ground by smallholders and plantations were less efficient because it was done in isolation. So learning from the situation, together with strong support from Sabah Wildlife Department and partners of conservation organizations like Sratu Atai and Hutan, EF have supported formation of the Human Elephant Coexistence Committee and community patrolling team, mostly by, uh, formed by smallholders in Ulu Muanat. This committee enabled various stakeholders such as estates, smallholders, and government agencies and NGOs to collaborate and coordinate to implement long-term strategies in a landscape level for the protection of elephants and mitigate damage to the smallholders and plantation owners. These strategies include such as establishment of wildlife corridors, integrated fencing, coordinated community-based patrolling, and community awareness. Through this committee and community patrolling, now a total of over 7,000 hectares of uh, land, including uh, oil palm estates, small older plots, and forest border is being monitored and managed for the protection of elephants and crops. As a result of these activities, between 2019 to 2020, smallholders in the project site reported 48% decrease in crop, crop loss due to the elephant rates. Next slide, please. We also observed that independent oil palm smallholders often face situation of low volume or low quality of their hours, mostly in the range of 10 to 12 tons per hectare, mostly this in our project site. So this has 
there are several factors for this to happen. Among the common observed factors were new aging trees, smallholder financially not ready to undertake replanting, uh, gaps in farm management, and challenges in accessing farm goods. So following from this situation, in close collaboration with lo local extension agencies and private sectors such as dealers, millers, and agri-input suppliers, we have been conducting various capacity building activities for smallholders in improving their farm productivity. Some of the activities are including technical trainings and guidance around best management practice, and also to facilitate smallholders to access into uh, continuous agro input, and also to private and government schemes such as Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil Certification. From this effort, close to 140 smallholders are being guided and in improving their productivity and over 200 smallholders have been facilitated in the application into MSPO. And from a sample size among all the smallholders that we have been guiding, we managed to observe that there is an 18% of increase in the volume of harvested crop between 2019 and 2020. However, this is only a sample and initial analysis. We will be working further to strengthen the monitoring and an analysis of outcomes due to our activities. Next, please. And also we observed that most of the smallholders are heavily dependent on the oil palm as the major cultivation on their land, which contribute most to their income. And when smallholders face situations such as the fluctuating crop price, reduction in yield, crop loss by elephant raids, and the major source of their income is becoming not stable. Thus, yeah, this is affecting their livelihood. So to mitigate this, we can see smallholders were, were already or at least intend to venture into diversification but they were needed support to strengthen their effort and kickstart their plans. So what we have been doing over this year, together with government agencies and successful entrepreneurs, researchers, and buyers, we have been conducting awareness on income opportunities. We have been facilitating smallholders to, uh, to market connections and providing them with technical trainings. So through these activities, now we have close to 700 smallholders who have diversified into various activities such as good integration, Fifflet bird nest, stingless bee farming, and handicraft sales. Our team is now closely monitoring the impact of such diversification on the smallholder life, livelihood. Next slide. In general, despite the challenges, we also observe that smallholders are enterprising and always work towards solutions. In all our efforts, rather than top-down approach, we place more of a facilitator role to support smallholders to enhance their own efforts and improve their access into existing solutions. So to co-develop new solution and also strengthen the existing ones. So now we are moving into another area that EF have been actively involved in Sabah, which is on the children in plantation situation. So as I already shared some, uh, some high level context of the migrant worker situation at the beginning, following that context, since 2017, EF have organized series of consultation with palm oil producing companies, brands, relevant government agencies and NGOs to discuss on the issues faced by children in plantations. Following that, we develop resources that can assist companies in the effort to improve well-being of children in plantation, such as the Directory on the Services for Vulnerable Children. And towards end of last year, we also launched the Child Risk Assessment Framework document. This document can help companies to identify risk faced by children in plantations and develop solutions to strengthen the children's protection. And this year, we will be organizing a series of activities with upstream companies, including piloting the child risk assessment framework, child right webinar, training of child risk assessment for the upstream companies. And in this year, EF also will be conducting social diagnostics in our core landscape area to better understand the present situation in the landscape area around other social issues and to determine key areas for transformation in the coming years. Next slide, please. So all the outcomes that achieved in these past years will not be the total solutions to address the challenges in the palm oil supply base in Sabah, but definitely among the progressive steps towards addressing those complex challenges. So in this landscape, for the next five years, with the continuous collaboration with the local stakeholders and with the spirit of co-development, we aim to scale our current smallholder support activities to reach an impact at least 5,000 over smallholders, to continue to strengthen and scale up the current efforts in protecting key habitats such as the Human Elephant Committee, and develop targeted intervention to reduce deforestation by communities 
and companies bordering key sensitive areas. Continue our collective efforts to improve workers' welfare and well being of children through targeted interventions, which includes working with palm oil producers and companies to conduct child risk assessment and to strengthen child protection efforts. And through our supply chain engagement activities, we will continue to support supplier companies operating in the landscape to achieve 100% traceable, traceability to plantation and actively implementing strong sustainability policies, policies such as Next slide, please. So we hope the progress and outcomes that will be achieved in these next five years can showcase the possibility of harmonizing sustainable economic development, forest conservation, decent work opportunities, and resilient livelihood for communities anchored in a farmer centric landscape model in Sabah. So for those companies and stakeholders aligned with this vision, we welcome all of you to be part of this effort. I think, yep. So thanks. That's all for my sharing today. Many thanks to all of you and terima kasih. Thank you, Prasad. So um, if you have questions for Prasad, do, do use the uh, Q&A function. It, it's right there in the middle at the bottom part of the page. Um, and yeah, do list them out and do, we'll try to uh, Take that up towards the end, you know. So next we have Uncle Herbert. So it is a special moment, and I'm sure that we are very keen to hear from Uncle Herbert. Yeah, Uncle Herbert. Um, maybe you can start by sharing with everyone a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm. Uh, uh, I feel uh, uh, really uh, very happy to be part of this program, and. I hope uh, what I'm going to talk about will be in, uh, informative. Now, I'm uh, Herbert, uh, a farmer from Ulu Muanad. I had been a small holder since 22 years ago, but beca I became a full-time farmer after my retirement uh, about uh, eight years ago. In my small uh, plot of land that is about 7.5 hectares. I planted oil farm and integrated it with uh, uh, some other crops like bananas, vegetables, and a few uh, fruit trees. Now, uh, as a small holder, uh, we in this area, we face several changes, uh, challenges, I mean. Uh, the challenges, uh, I consider it as, um, domestic in nature, because um, to some uh, of the farmers, they can do their own work. But uh, to me, as a former uh, government servant, I cannot do uh, all this work. So I paid someone, I paid someone to do the work for me that is clearing the land. And then um, uh, making uh, terraces, and then fertilizing and keeping the uh, grass uh, short. Right now, uh, that's why I call this one is uh, our domestic challenges. But uh, the real challenge that, that we are facing as smallholder here in Ulmuanad is the intrusion of elephants into our land. Now. We don't consider this a challenge. This is a real problem to us because uh, oh, this year alone, uh, elephants have uh, intruded into my farm four times. And the last one was last week. And then um, uh, another challenge that uh, I, I face is the price fluctuation. Price fluctuation, uh, uh, press uh, fruit bunch and it coincides with the uh, fruit uh, season. Uh, normally, uh, oil palm uh, will bear fruit, uh, good production in six months and uh, uh, six months is uh, uh, the harvest is down. So these are the conditions that we are facing as a uh, uh, as a small holder. 
And um, uh, for these challenges, uh, uh, we have uh, been uh, uh, very, what should I say, uh, lucky because uh, the wildlife department uh, is willing to help us uh, with this uh, problem that is the uh, elephant intrusion and uh, uh, the EF field stops also initiated uh, this uh, what we call uh, volunteers to help the smallholders drive away the elephant uh, so that uh, the destruction they make will be uh, minimized. And then um, aside from that, uh, uh, the challenges that we are fa facing, another challenge that we're facing is the price fluctuation. And then uh, because of this price uh, fluctuation, it the fruit fruiting season also fluctuate. Six months, I said just now, six months, uh, the, the fruits, fruits are uh, good. Eh? We are uh, getting a good, uh, uh, what should I say? Uh, good harvest, good yield. Uh, good, yeah, good harvest. We are getting yeah. good harvest. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. And then uh, six months will uh, the, the harvest is down. So uh, for this one, I think um, this is for everyone's initiatives that is to uh, uh, make um, proper financial planning so that we can face uh, the time when the uh, precision is down. So uh, those are the part of the uh, steps that we uh, take to uh, overcome the challenges. And the, the last one, but not the least, is the uh, EF uh, field staff uh, expose us to several uh, training, uh, several chances of uh, uh, diversifying our income. That is uh, to build a sweetlet bird nest house, and then um, uh, some are uh, sent to have the course in uh, handicraft and uh, several others. So this helped us a lot. Uh, they also come, uh, often come to our farm to teach us or give guidance how to uh, fertilize. And then uh, they also, uh, uh, Called uh, call. What is it? Um, NGOs, NGOs uh, to uh, show us the way how to use the tools uh, to make uh, our work easier. So, um, what I'm hoping for the future, what I'm hoping for the future is um, uh, none others than the our problem of elephant, elephant uh, intrusion in our place will be solved very soon uh, with the action of the wildlife department now. They are doing the translocation and uh, we are hoping that the, all the elephants, it's not, uh, uh, there are only a few elephants in our place, I think about uh, three to five. And then um, some are already uh, translocated. And the other one is uh, we are hoping that the price of the oil, palm oil will stabilize as it is now. So I think that's all that I can share this uh, afternoon. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank thank, thank you so much, Uncle Herbert. Uh, we, we also have quite a unique opportunity here on the call. You have you know multinational brands and companies. Would you like to share a message with them? in the next one minute before we hand across to Dr. Farina. Any message oh, yeah. for them? <laughs> uh, we would like to thank uh, uh, everyone or whoever is uh, involved in this program that uh, 
uh, it really it is really informative and we are hoping that in the near future near future we received all this type of uh, uh, help or guidance uh, to upgrade our our what else, uh, farming skill and then and, uh, and all that so that's I, I think that's all I, I can talk about that thank you thank you so much uncle Herbert all right, so if you have any questions for Uncle Herbert, do use the Q&A function. Uh, in the meantime, uh, to keep uh, to the timing, um, I would like to welcome Dr. Farina for, her, for the next session. Dr. Farina, over to you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. All right, so if we can go to the first slide, please. So today, uh, both me, uh, myself and Mark, we want to bring you to another landscape in Sabah, which is Hinabatangan region. So this is actually the home to, uh, you know, many endemic species of Borneo. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this landscape now has gone uh, you know, some severe deforestation and uh, fragmentation uh, due to the uh, social uh, economic development. Uh, next one, please. And one of the species that you can find here in this landscape is the iconic uh, Bornean elephant. Uh, this endangered species uh, is actually um, genetically different from the other Asian elephant population. So you don't find a uh, burden elephant if they go in uh, extinct, then you don't find any replacement for this population. Uh, there are about 1,500 uh, wild elephant left, uh, and most of them are found in east coast of Sabah and north Kalimantan. So you don't find a uh, burden elephant in either Sarawak or Brunei. So, you know, um, with one of the challenges for this, uh, uh, for this species to live in Kinabatangan region is that uh, they, they, they cannot move around easily right now uh, because of, you know, we have identified several bottlenecks and this really hinder them from moving. Um, so uh, over the years, we realized that uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. We realized that if we want to keep, uh, you know, our the survival of the burning elephants in this landscape, uh, we have to figure out, you know, like a holistic way and like a more comprehensive approach uh, at the landscape level if we want to safeguard this population. So, you know, we begin by in 2008, we begin to collar uh, elephants with satellite collars. Uh, with another NGO, the Nogiran Field Center, we have collected more than 14 elephants uh, because we want to know uh, where they're going. You know, we want to know what are the uh, most important uh, area for them. Uh, and usually we call them female elephants because they are more sensitive to the changes in their habitats. And, you know, female elephants, they tend to uh, pick an uh, area where is the most safest and also have, you know, abundance of food resources for them. Um, so uh, since then, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So this is the kind of data that we get when we call it an elephant. This is the movement data from Ratu, who uh, the female elephant that we call it in 2016. And as you can see in the yellow, uh, sorry, in the uh, green color there, those are the wildlife uh, sanctuary. Uh, but actually uh, the elephant, you know, they cannot access to all of this protected area, mainly because this area are swampy and also hilly. So it's not really suitable for the elephants. They can only use half of this protected area. And over the years, we see that more and more the elephants are spending their time in the oil palm plantation landscape, which is surrounded, uh, you know, surrounding uh, Kinabatangan. Um, and then we, as we suspected, you know, um, man-made barriers such as electric fences, uh, sorry, electric fencing and also trenches, you know, they really uh, stop the elephants uh, from getting the access to the traditional uh, dispersal area. Uh, next one, please. So, so we asked ourselves why the elephants are attracted to the oil palm landscape. You know, after all, this area is, you know, is quite, it's not really safe for them. So why they want to go to this landscape? 
uh, obviously one of the answer is this this landscape used to be part of their traditional like i said dispersal and feeding ground so somehow uh, you know when when you have we, we converted it the elephants still want to go to this landscape and utilize them um, and then remember i was telling you there are many uh, bottlenecks there are many um, uh, you know problems for the elephants to move in their wild habitats uh, and then uh, imagine two forest block and then you have a uh, plantation in the middle so somehow the elephant are forced to use this landscape uh, most interestingly is that in, in Kinabatangan region, uh, you know, after 25 years or so, uh, the uh, oil palm trees, they are tall, very tall now, and it's not really economical to kind of maintain them. They don't produce much yield. So what they do, they will replant this area. Um, so when they fell the tree and they shredded the trees into small pieces, then, you know, you have the shoots. So this is the part where the elephant love the most. So they will come and eat. It's like a feeding uh, area for the elephants. Um, and then, uh, but it's not really safe, you know, both for people and elephants, because the more time the elephants spend in the plantation, the more conflict situation will arise. It causes, you know, uh, crop damages and properties damages to the people. And then because of the out of the frustration, we tend to, you know, maybe uh, take the decision to to. To, to kill the elephants and a lot of babies has been separated from from their group okay next one please so obviously the most immediate thing that we take or you know that what people want to take is like okay let's translocate the elephants to other area so that we don't have problem in our area which is actually you are not solving the problem but you are actually translocating remove bring this problem to another area. If the elephants are the residents of that area, he's familiar with, um, uh, you know, like A, A area, but then you move it to B area, to other forest reserves. So the elephants are not familiar and it starts to create problem in this new area. So, and then, you know, you bring again these elephants to another area. So each of these translocation is not only costly, but again, we are not really solving this and the elephant will for sure come back. We have been, we proved this through our uh, movement data. Uh, and we we know that a lot of time in, in this process, elephants can be, you know, die. So we have several elephants die because of this uh, program. Um, you know, so it's actually, we, we are losing our elephants by, you know, we thought that it's a good intention, but we are losing uh, our elephants to uh, from this kind of program. Uh, okay, ne next one, please. Uh, so another thing that is quite actually effective in Sabah is the electric fencing. Uh, again, uh, you know, for for it, it, there are three kind of main characteristic if you want to make sure that this electric fencing work. First, you need to make sure where you put the location. You have to check, uh, you know, the specification of your electric fencing, and then you have to also maintain them. So usually, uh, you know, like what we get uh, when, uh, when we speak to the smallholders, they always tell us that, oh, big companies, they have uh, money to erect the electric fencing. They, they can secure their boundaries. Uh, so the elephants are diverted now to the smallholders uh, plantation uh, farms, you know, uh, small farm. And if you don't plan this, you know, different companies secure their own boundary. So you are actually, we are actually creating layers of electric fencing. So imagine if you, you will not stop an intelligent animals who is determined to go to one area. So nothing will stop them. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, so if we don't really plan this, we are creating, a, you know, more uh, difficult uh, situation for the elephant to pass one area. Um, all right, so next one, please. All right, so we are grateful because in 2017, there is uh, one plantation in this region, Malanking Oil Palm Plantation, who, uh, you know, we are working with them, we join forces with them. Uh, we want to try to create a 
kind of um, safe passage, the right of passage for, for elephants, for orang utan, and for other uh, wildlife species as well to move in this, uh, you know, uh, mixed forest agricultural landscape. Um, we believe that, uh, you know, like now during this uh, replanting, uh, program that most of the plantation are doing right now is the best time to rearrange uh, the landscape so that you will take now into account uh, the welfare or the needs of uh, other uh, living things as well, especially the elephants. Um, so from this, um, you know, they, they also restored this uh, landscape. So currently, if I'm not mistaken, they have planted about 100,000 sapling uh, in, their, in their corridor. Uh, we are hoping that this project, you know, can show that the oil palm plantation actually can play a big role in biodiversity conservation, but at the same time, they can sustain their ben uh, business benefits. Next one, please. And then we also rest on our experience uh, working in this landscape. We, we, it's very crucial to have uh, elephant uh, community elephant ranger team because they are like a <clears throat> ambassador to they know the geographical area they know the tradition they know the culture so they can you know um, harness uh, the the supports to elephant conservation uh, among the the local communities so we have trained, uh, you know, the, uh, so far in Sabah we have trained two local communities uh, ranger elephant ranger team. Uh, and one in Ulumwanat, as um, uh, Prasad was showing before. Um, all right, next one, please. So, but obviously, like I said, there, you you will never solve human and elephants conflict. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, like um, male elephant, especially, they are more. Uh, adventurous so they will they don't mind to go to risky area as long as they get more they gain from it you know they eat they get to eat a lot and they have like a very good uh, body conditions and stuff like this so we we need so this this year uh for for the next uh two years we will try to develop this livelihood insurance for elephants so basically we are hoping that by giving um uh you know monetary uh, assistance to the smallholders, especially independent smallholders, we will get to increase their tolerance. Uh, they don't have much resources, so we think that by having this insurance could improve their supports and also tolerance towards the elephants. Uh, next one, please. So, uh, uh, bef as a conclusion to my talk, uh, we, we know that if we want to try to do this landscape approach, uh, you know, um, to, to safeguard the wild elephants, Everyone, there, there are so many stakeholders, so we must share, we must have, you know, shared vision. Um, if we don't get support from one of these, uh, you know, stakeholder, then I don't think that we can achieve uh, a lot, uh, you know, for Sabah. So I think that's all. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you, Carl. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Farina. Very interesting work. So uh, for our final speaker, let me welcome Mr. Pierre Boxster. Pierre, over to you, Pierre. Thanks so much and uh, great to be here and, and uh, wonderful to hear from uh, Prasad, mm. Uncle Herbert and, and Farina too. Um, it's always great to understand how what we see often as a production landscape, a, a sourcing area is also a living, breathing environment uh, for wildlife and, and people's livelihoods. So good to be here and, and thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name is Pierre Boxett. I work within the sustainability team at RB. Um, you might have, uh, at Reckitt, I do apologise. We've changed our name uh, to Reckitt uh, to better reflect a corporate purpose that we have uh, to protect, heal and nurture in the relentless pursuit of a cleaner, healthier world. And I think a lot of those words in our purpose resonate very well with uh, some of what we've heard here. My apologies, I've got a few technical difficulties at the moment and I'm having to do this on my phone. So I'm going to turn my camera off while I go through the slides, but uh, and, and, you know, huge apologies for that. I wanted to start with this uh, uh, quote from uh, John F. Kennedy. He, he used this analogy in 1963, uh, the rising tide lifts all the boats. He was referring to the effect that an improved economy can have 
on various parts of society, that if you improve the economy generally, you touch the livelihoods of many people all around in society and generally make uh, it better for, for everybody concerned. And it struck me that this was a useful analogy for the production landscape that we work within here in, 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 in Sabah. Uh, and to use, sorry, I, I just got still on this slide. I'll say when I'm moving to the, the next slides. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, a useful analogy for, for Saba um, and the various uh, effects that different programs can have on different parts of the communities that, that we've heard from. As we also heard, Saba is a large production area for palm oil. Uh, it's the second biggest in Malaysia, I understand, with over 130 mills. Earthworms analysis shows or has recently shown that the membership buys from a very large proportion of those mills, that the suppliers supplying members of earthworm uh, buy from the vast majority of those. But I suspect they buy a fairly small proportion of the total uh, oil that those mills process over time. And I think it's the scale of this production landscape uh, that ultimately dictates that we take a, a more collective approach to addressing some of the challenges um, and that we do that at, at scale. In other words, that we're able to do that. Um, uh, we're able to do that and, and rise the tide in that sense, if the tide is uh, NDPE, which Carl referred to earlier, and affect all the boats um, in the harbour. Next slide, please. I just want to start with a very simple uh, overview of our, of our supply chain and how we interface, if you like, with the production landscape um, in Saba. Analysis by Earthworm show, showed recently that we are suppliers purchased from a total of around 80 of the total mills um, in Saba, or at least have done at any given point um, in time. So very much this production landscape is our production landscape. It's complicated by the fact that even though we buy from two direct suppliers and through them two processing refineries, our suppliers also buy from around 20 other third party refineries. And those, each of which really represents their own touch point with the mills, we can, it, it's, it's only through our suppliers and their suppliers that we have a relationship with these mills and ultimately have a relationship with the plantations um, like those of, of Uncle Herbert uh, that we've heard from. And of course, the mills themselves are characterized by quite complex supply chains. Probably most of us on this call are familiar, but of course, trace of the poor traceability um, and a lack of knowledge of where fresh fruit bunches comes from is often a are often characteristics of mill supply chains. And so our visibility is difficult. If we go back to the analogy with JFK, the boats that we want to lift through the work that we support, the farmers, their families, their communities are actually often very difficult to find and ultimately reach in our programs. Uh, next slide, please. So based on this characteristic, the first thing we want to do is, is, is basically shine a light on this landscape to try and understand it as a company uh, better and to understand the challenges that we face, which we've heard um, in, some, in quite some detail. And there are really two key components um, to, to doing that. The first is establishing the traceability in our supply chain, like I've said, by asking suppliers to list the mills that they that have supplied them over the last uh, 12 months and the locations and names of those and also where possible the locations and names of the plantations and actually smallholders that can that actually supply those mills and it's an incomplete picture um, globally we've only really managed to establish traceability to 90 percent of the mills that we buy from so there's still a chunk there that we we need to work on and plantation wise is much lower so we really rely on the kind of programs that we've heard from on the ground, working with local stakeholders uh, to reach those people that we that we need to affect uh, in order to help them meet the challenges that we've heard about. The second uh, process is really to work through our suppliers. Uh, we started working with two, our two big suppliers in Malaysia using a questionnaire uh, to ask them about uh, the implementation of NDPE practices um, in their supply chains 
uh, and better understand how that's being implemented upstream uh, at mill level and at plantation level. And it's helping us to understand better the extent to which these programs are having uh, on, on the plantations and, and which programs are the, our suppliers have in place and are supporting and the extent to which they're able uh, to verify uh, that deforestation is being addressed um, in our supply chains. Next slide, please. So using that improved visibility, uh, using the programs our suppliers have to reach out to their suppliers and understand uh, what's being done at ground level uh, and understanding and using traceability. Um, we've supported targeted interventions um, to improve implementation of NDPE. And we've heard in depth from uh, rurality and we've heard also about the work being done to address uh, migrant labor. Uh, and we've supported both those initiatives through the ethical recruitment initiative uh, with Earthworm and working with one of our suppliers to implement uh, the use of tools on that. Um, we've also been using the Starling platform to understand where deforestation is happening in relation to mills and then work with suppliers to understand whether this can be attributed to the mill supply chain or not. But through these targeted interventions, of course, we're still only reaching a small proportion of the total um, of the total production landscape and the total supply shed, and it's for that reason that uh, a landscapes approach, a wider landscapes approach, uh, appeals to us greatly. Uh, next slide, please. And I won't go into to this. Prasad went into this in, in quite some uh, detail, but what we can quickly see is that through a landscapes approach, we are ultimately able to dramatically increase the scale of improvements and address at much greater scale the drivers of deforestation and also exploitation in supply chains uh, that we see. These are extremely ambitious goals on this slide uh, that Earthworm has, has set itself, starting with an improved uh, policy base, people committed to, to implementing NDP, working through much more improved traceability uh, to plantation so we actually understand the production landscapes and as I say ultimately targeting the, the key drivers at work. And then next slide please. I think uh, this, this scale of ambition is good. Um, what I want to focus on um, as I, as I reach my final uh, minute, I believe, is the challenge, I think, of, 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 the, of, of, of understanding the scale, but at the same time still using the connection we have with our suppliers to reach down into the uh, production landscape and actually affect change at ground uh, level. I also think that there are some really good and important parts of a landscapes approach that we need to think about and perhaps discuss in the, in the, in the time we have left. I've borrowed here a bit from the uh, thinking that we're doing with the Consumer Goods Forum, uh, which has a number of companies um, on board. And I'll just really list them quickly because I think it's a good place to finish this, this conversation. Um, and that is that we actively uh, encourage the participation of lots of supply chain actors, perhaps from other industries as well. Um, Earthworms made tremendous progress on engaging government at local and regional level. I think that's a really important component of the work. Uh, we also need, as we are in this program, to consult and empower local stakeholders um, and really build the connectivity between uh, between the stakeholders involved in these uh, in these in these projects, and in so doing, unlock additional resources that can really help drive this change at at scale. So it's really building a connection between the work of the landscapes program to engage and involve stakeholders in delivering change, and matching that with our own commitment and involvement with our suppliers and our supply chains, uh, which we can use to uh, further drive change through the landscapes program. So I'll finish there. I'm sorry I've taken a little bit more time. I hope that was uh, useful um, as, a, as, a, as an addition to the speakers. But um, thanks very much. And uh, over to you, Carl. Thank you so much, Pierre.
All right, so it's uh, we got a few minutes left for questions and answers, but uh, before we go into them, um, rest assured we'll do our best. If we can't cover all of them on the remaining minutes, we'll still um, try to reach back to you over email, right? So I see a couple of questions have trickled in already. Um, the first one is to Prasad, yeah? So what are the main and most effective best management practices that farmers have been supported to use in Sabah? Prasad, you want to take yeah. that up? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, some of the things that we have been doing is around uh, encouraging farmers to have uh, better plot maintenance. So this is uh, around uh, having a, a proper weeding, proper pruning, and also having a good harvest uh, part in their plot so that it will be like really increasing uh, the smallholder efforts in, in gaining the harvesting. And also to introduce uh, tools um, that are uh, like smallholders have been uh, what we're hearing from smallholders are like like light harvesting tools that can really help farmers to improve their their existing practices. So these have been some of the simple and uh, most welcomed uh, things from farmers uh, from our efforts. Thank you, Prasad. Um, All right, um, there's some questions in the chat chat function as well. Farina, it looks like you got another one. Um, do you want to take that up? It's about what activities are carried out to protect smallholder land from elephant disturbance without endangering the elephants or ensuring that these elephants still have the right to live and a suitable habitat for their needs. Uh, so, okay, thank you for the question. Um, let me read again. Uh, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, so it's in the chat one, right? Not the. It's in the Q and A. Oh, Q and A. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, are we talking about this landscape uh, uh, or Kinabatanga landscape? I mean, for for the Kinabatanga landscape, uh, mm. we actually, like I say, we have this um, elephant. Uh, we call elephant conservation unit. So basically, we also have, uh, you know, uh, we have put several like early warning systems where we can pre kind of tell the elephant movement before they come to sensitive area. And we have our team uh, to go and try to peacefully uh, divert elephants uh, away from this sensitive area. Uh, so, and sometimes uh, that's why, and it's also, that's why we want to work on this life uh, insurance because we know that we cannot stop the elephants from coming in, you know, at night or something like that. So there will be some more uh, damages. So we want to try to develop this insurance so that it, uh, it can cover uh, some losses of, of the smallholders. Thank you, Dr. Farina. Um, sorry, I'm rushing through the questions here. Time is ticking. Uh, Pierre, it looks like you have one um, from Katrina. So how, how do you see other companies uh, in terms of their role in investing in Sabah, like Racket has, you know, what areas? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is the whole point about uh, the landscapes approach that uh, we collectively support the whole the whole program and take responsibility for it um, because we have so much of this production landscape in common. We might buy from different suppliers, but we do also uh, know that those suppliers actually buy from many of the same mills and affect and have the same effect. So it's crucial that uh, other companies join, and I'm really pleased that we. Uh, that we're one of many in supporting uh, this initiative. But the point of the Landscapes Programme is we know one company is not supporting specific projects within it now. We're all supporting the, the total project at scale. And what I was trying to say in my talk is that I think we need to do that. Um, but at the same time, not forget that it's through our suppliers and our suppliers' supply chains that we can also learn more and contribute more to the landscapes uh, program. So it's really crucial, I think, that we engage and involve our suppliers and as much as possible, uh, the, the, the entities that supply them. It keeps it real for, for, our, for, our, for companies like Reckitt um, and enables us to continue to have uh, involvement and engagement in, the, in, this, in this production landscape. Thank you so much, Pierre. 
in the last minute that we have, I would like to respond to Gregory's question that uh, he put in the chat function. So his question was, how do all actors engage in the landscape? Project governance commonly agree on desired outcomes like elephant population, conservation objectives, child engagement programs. Are these objectives captured in landscape level performance indicators? Would it be possible to share this? So thanks, Greg, for thanks, Gregory, for, for this very good question. Essentially, this is one of our key focus areas for 2021 to try to set up the, the actual project governance. So this would uh, entail a lot of discussion with our partners in the landscape like Racket, and we're welcoming more companies to be uh, part of this landscape also as well. So do reach out to us if, you're, if your organization is uh, interested to, to be working alongside us. So setting up that framework would essentially be a consultative process together with partners and also stakeholders on the ground, like Dr. Farina's organization, like government actors. So that's something we want to set up this year. So for the second part, where the objectives are captured in the landscape level performance indicators, yes, for sure. So this is something that's already been drafted uh, and being finalized as we speak. And would it be possible to share this? It happens at various levels. I think for the public, this is something we'll want to share you know, down the road. But uh, for, for project partners, of course, there is um, a little bit more visibility and it, perhaps even more, um, I would say, opportunity you know, to work together with us to set that up. So we're right on the dot. Um, I'm sorry time is up, but um, we'll, we'll do our best to follow up with this uh, webinar with emails to everyone uh, that has joined to share with you key takeaway points from this webinar. And to conclude, so thank you so much for the participation. And yeah, if you would like to learn more about the Saba landscape, there is actually a kickoff call that is scheduled towards the end of this month. You will see more details of this in the email that we will send out to all the participants. So until then, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you.